have someone, a Dr. William Stafford, come and to, uh, to do a grand rounds for the AIDS Institute. And um, I'm representing the behavioral science and prevention core of the AIDS Institute. And my name is Gail Wyatt, for those of you who don't know me. Um, and I've known David in another venue. I won't be able to tell you all those stories. So I'm just going to be here so we can use every minute of 50 minutes. Right, Nina and, and Lorena? 50 minutes, we've got to hear him, and then we have 10 minutes of robust questions and answers. So we cannot let him leave without answering something really hard, okay? <laughs> Make him think, challenge him. All right. So David Williams uh, is a Florence and Laura Norman professor of public health at the Harvard School of Public Health and the professor of African and African American Studies and of Sociology at Harvard University. Previously, he served six years on the faculty of Yale University and 14 at the University of Michigan. He holds an MPH from Loma Linda, right across the way, and PhD in sociology from the University of Michigan. Dr. Williams is an internationally recognized authority on social influences on health. He's been invited to keynote specific oh, scientific conferences in Europe, Africa, Australia, the Middle East, South America, and across the United States. His research has enhanced our understanding of the complex ways in which socioeconomic status, race, stress, racial discrimination, and religious involvement can affect physical and mental health. He is the author of more than 350 scholarly publications. I've been just really in awe of that. They don't know how you've done that. And he has served on edi editorial boards of 12 scientific journals as a reviewer for over 60 journals. He was ranked as one of the top 10 most cited researchers in the social sciences in the world across the decade, 1995 to 2005, and as the most cited black scholar in the social sciences in 2008. In 2014, Thomas Reuters ranked him as one of the world's most influential scientific minds. That is pretty cool, isn't it? Mm -hmm. There's so much more. He's received so many honors. We all love him. We all look up to him because he's such a totally committed brother. And he has such a scientific mind. But he's a nice man. <laughs> I don't say that about him. Give him a warm round of applause. Yeah. I need to come here more often so I get all of this wonderful <laughs> affirmation. <laughs> no, it's, it's, it's wonderful to be here. My, my last time on campus, um, Dr. Wyatt, was actually speaking for your center. I think you had a series of presentations I came here for. I don't remember how long ago that was. 2009? Oh, my goodness. Uh, it's been a while, but... <laughs> but um, but it's good to come back and good to be here with you and to um, uh, share um, some of the work that I have, have done as well as the work of others in the domain of, of discrimination. I decided to talk today about, to give you a global overview of the research on discrimination and health in general. And towards the end of my talk, I think there are others here who study um, discrimination in HIV and, and have enormous expertise in the area. Um, but like I'm thinking of Chandra when I said that statement, Chandra. So, but, um, but I wanted to, to talk about the, the, the growth of the work and the development of, of the work to study in the area of discrimination and health, but also reflect um, on, on a paper that I worked on with some other colleagues thinking of stigma uh, of, of, of discrimination, its implications for understanding racial ethnic differences in HIV and AIDS. I want to reflect on that at the end. So I have a lot of territory to cover, so I'm going to just jump right in to my presentation. So we have that 10 minutes reserved um, for conversation at the end. So first of all, I, I thought uh, I would come back to HIV too at the end. Most of my talk is not about HIV infection, but just to ground us all in, in terms of the, the challenge of HIV AIDS, which is in, in fact an enormous uh, disparity uh, when you look across uh, disparities in the United States. This is one of, of the largest um, that exist, um, where you can see here are rates of diagnosis of HIV. This is from CDC, 
among adults and adolescents by race ethnicity 20, 2009 to 2013. And you can see the towering excess uh, profile uh, for African Americans. And uh, it's been high and it's, it's in fact staying high. Um, you could see multiple racial groups as one group that's going down. Um, uh, American in, uh, Hispanic Latinos have um, also a, a relatively elevated rate as well as, as does Native Hawaiians and other Pacific Islanders um, and uh, American Indians and, and Alaska Natives. Um, and you can see the, the lowest rate at the bottom overall is for whites and, and Asians. So it's an area of, of really dramatic public health importance because of how elevated the disparities are. And this is just some de further detail um, of African Americans of the total diagnosis during this period, 46% of the total, 12% of the population, 46% of the total. Um, among women, 63%, uh, African American women, 63% of women, um, blacks and African American, 64% of infections attributed to heterosexual contact. Um, black and African American children, 67% of the children under age 13. So huge uh, numbers and really talking about the extent of the disparity. Uh, you can also see the elevated uh, risk uh, for Latinos as well, 22% uh, of the total, 18% um, of infections attributed to heterosexual contact, um, and Latino children, 12% of the children. So these two groups uh, do carry a disproportionate burden of that disease. So let me talk about uh, more generally the, 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 the work on, on discrimination in health and what we have learned over time. I think one of the drivers of the early interest in trying to identify does discrimination, does racism play a role in health was driven by the patterns of racial inequalities in health. Um, so first of all, we have large racial ethnic inequalities in health in the United States and the fact that these disparities are persistent over time. So we haven't made much success in reducing them over time, in, in spite of the fact we've been talking about them and studying them, and there have been a range of interventions. We, we've not really made much difference in, in reducing them. There's, there's some outcomes for which we, there, there's some reduction. There's some outcomes for which the gaps are widening over time. Not only do we have um, disparities if we look at the prevalence of disease and if we look at overall mortality, but one of the dramatic patterns is the earlier onset of disease. So diseases occur uh, at younger ages. Um, they tend to be more severe. Researchers use multiple terms. Accelerated aging is one of them. Weathering is another one, referring to the dramatically earlier onset of disease. Not only is the disease the higher prevalence, earlier onset, but it's greater severity of disease. So even for some outcomes, you can think of depression as one of those outcomes where African Americans, in the best data we have, have lower rates of major depression than whites do. Once depressed, though, disease is much more severe. Um, so even for some conditions which they are somewhat protected from, once the condition occurs, all of the outcomes are worse. The, the severity is, is, is greater. Um, treatment um, is less likely to occur. The recurrence of the disease is more, is more, it's more likely to be persistent. And then another driver of the interest in, in a potential role of racism was the fact that there's a racial difference in health at every level of socioeconomic status. Socioeconomic status, measured by income, education, occupational status, I'll abbreviate that SES in my talk, I mean socioeconomic status, uh, is a, a big determinant of variations in health in the world, um, globally, across the world, in various countries, know, know someone's individual education, income, occupational status, wealth, it tells you a lot about health. Uh, in the early days, when I started my career, most researchers believed that if we only adjusted the racial difference for socioeconomic status, it would go away. It was all driven by socioeconomic status. Now we have data suggesting a, an effect of race even at every level of socioeconomic status. So that led researchers to think there is something else about race that, that matters and producing these patterns of health and could racism be a, a missing piece of the puzzle that helps us to understand what these um, differences, what, what these drivers of, of these patterns of health are. I think the other uh, important point 
to make is that we have a lot of evidence suggesting that despite the fact we've made enormous progress on race, and we want to celebrate the progress that we've made on race in the United States, there are nonetheless ubiquitous signs of the pervasiveness of racism in American culture. And I want to give you just some quick examples of how pervasive racism is actually in the world um, and how easily activated we have little signs of racism. Um, here is a paper from a Belgian newspaper uh, last year um, that depicts President Obama and his wife as apes. Um, and as part of this article has um, a, a headline that says that President Obama was selling weed. Um, now, what makes this quite striking, this was in March 2014, this article appeared the week before President Obama was making an official visit to the country of Belgium. Um, the Belgian newspaper that printed this is a progressive newspaper. This is not a conservative right-wing newspaper. This was a progressive newspaper. And they thought of this article as a satire, a satirical piece. And they joked about Obama selling um, marijuana. And they claimed that they got all of this information in a, a package that they received from Vladimir Putin, the Russian president. Um, and so they thought of it as just a, a, a joke. However, given the history of, of associating blacks with apes, that uh, Phil Goff, a psychologist here at UCLA, has shown still persists uh, among people today and dramatically affects outcomes for indivi individuals, this was not uh, uh, funny. Um, and in fact, um, the newspaper uh, uh, quickly apologized when there was a worldwide outcry against um, this uh, particular article. But let me give you just another example to show you how, how close racism often is to, to the surface. April 25, 2012, it was the seventh game of the first round of the 2012 Stanley Cup playoffs. Um, the Boston Bruins, uh, my local hometown team, I live in Boston, uh, was the, the defending Stanley Cup champions. They had pushed the series to game seven. Of course, the Bruins fans knew that Boston was going to win Game 7. Um, they were playing at home. It's Game 7. They're the defending champions. They have to win the game. It just so happened that, in fact, against the Washington Capitals, in overtime, Boston lost the game. It just so happened that the player who scored the winning goal was Joel Ward, was black, from Toronto. Not one of the star hockey players in the league, but he just happened to score the winning goal. Twitter erupted um, with um, messages that I will not even read them, but you can read them on the screen. Um, the thing that was striking, and there are many more, these are just some examples. The thing that was striking to me was the degree to which the Boston Bruins fans, and it's understandable, I am a, a very dedicated Michigan Wolverine fan, and, and when my team lost, loses, it's painful. So I, I relate to that. I, I, I do understand that. I don't quite understand that the fact that the player on the opposing team who happened to score the goal, what big difference it made, what the race of that player was, and how frequently the N-word was used as, as people came to grips with it. And, and psychologically, what it means when they say the fact that the black person scored the goal made the loss hurt more, and that it made it 10 times worse that the black person scored the winning goal. And I eliminated the pictures. Most of these, these people posted them, their pictures are right next to it. This is not hidden, um, you know, um, but it also shows how spontaneous it was. And this is just one example. I, ha I actually have multiple other examples, one about the Hunger Games and, and one about President Obama interrupting uh, Sunday Night Football or NBC interrupting Sunday Night Football when President Obama was, was giving a, a speech to, the, to Newtown, Connecticut after the Newtown um, school massacre. And, and the, the Twitter erupted with the comments that people were making because this N-word person had now interrupted the Sunday Night Football game. So it's, it's amazing how much we get these signs uh, and how quickly we get them. This is from 2006, a CNN poll. 
Um, 84% of blacks and even two-thirds of whites believe that racism is a serious problem in the U.S. In fact, almost half of blacks and whites say they personally know someone who is racist. Um, only about 10% of both racial groups believe that they themselves are racist. Um, and half of African Americans and a quarter of whites said they had been the victim of racial discrimination. In fact, one of the most striking things I'm showing you here is a study that was done um, by two researchers at the Harvard Business School, um, published in, uh, it was done, conducted in two, 2011 and published later that year, and they asked blacks and whites to report how much discrimination there was against blacks and whites from the 1950s to currently. And you can see dramatically both blacks and whites report that back in the 1950s, over 90%, that there was discrimination um, against <laughs> blacks. And you can see both blacks and whites see a decline over time, with whites seeing a more precipitous decline than African Americans do. And both groups, white, African Americans at the bottom, reporting on the percent of the percent reporting that there was discrimination against whites. And even among African Americans, you can see some slight increase over time. And among whites, a steeper increase of the perception of discrimination against whites such that there is a crossover so that stunningly more whites today believe that discrimination against whites than there is discrimination against blacks. <laughs> this is a national sample of blacks and whites in the US. There is in fact striking evidence of the persistence of discrimination. I'll just in the interest of time just give you two quick examples. Um, and I'm drawing on the work of Deva Pager, a uh, sociologist now at Harvard, but this was her dissertation work at the University of Wisconsin. She did what's called an audit study. And audit studies provide some of the best evidence of the persistence of discrimination. In audit studies, you hold everything the same. The only thing you vary is the race of the person. So in this case, an audit study of employment, you get blacks and whites, dress them similarly, judge of equal attractiveness, and you give them identical resumes to hand in applying for 350 entry-level jobs. The only thing that differed was the race of the person handing in the resume. The resumes are identical. She threw a wrinkle into this study. Had one of the black males and one of the white males indicate on his resume that he was out on parole and he had served an 18-month prison sentence for cocaine possession. So Deva Pager found what you would expect to find. Whether you were black or white, if you had a criminal record, you were less likely to get a call back for a job. But she also found what we did not expect to find. It was easier for a white male with a criminal record to get a call back for a job than a black male whose record was clean. The resumes were identical. She replicated a study in New York City looking at blacks, whites, Latinos, found exactly the same thing. A black male and also Latino, technically the difference for the Latinos is not statistically significant, um, <clears throat> but the overall pattern is there. A black male and a Latino male is less likely to get a call back for a job than a white felon. Again, the resumes are uh, identical. Uh, stunning evidence, and there's just a ton. I can give you a lot of studies in the US that show the same thing in multiple domains of life. There's a wonderful American Sociological Review paper by Deva Pager, for those of you who are interested in, in how overwhelming the evidence is of the persistence of discrimination. I've also had a student uh, about two years ago look for me to find if there's similar data from around the world, and there is. There's data from most of the countries in Western Europe and Australia documenting discrimination based um, on persons who are perceived to be Middle Eastern or Arab, or Arab last names, Arabic last names, um, find similar patterns of discrimination. So I, I think overwhelmingly we have overwhelming evidence of the persistence of discrimination in contemporary society. And the question is, what on earth does that have to do with health? And c could that have consequences for health? I want to suggest that discrimination can uh, uh, adversely impact health through multiple mechanisms. And I'm going to spend most of my time today talking about the last mechanism, experiences of discrimination. But I put it last on this slide because uh, sometimes when people think about racism affecting health, it's the only thing they think about. Um, I get calls from people who tell me they've heard I've developed a scale that measures racism and they want to get this scale. And I, I haven't. 
I, I have not developed a scale that captures racism. I have a scale that measures one small part of discrimination. So it, it does not capture racism in all of its complexity. Um, the most powerful ways in which this racism affects health is through institutional mechanisms of racism. And the example I would give you in past, and I'm not going to spend much time talking about it today, but I think it's an important one that you have a clear sense of, is residential segregation. Um, residential segregation by race um, has been identified by observers of American society from Myrtle in 1944 in the American Dilemma as the key to understanding racial inequality in America. Um, John Sell, a historian of Duke University, wrote a book in the 70s on the origins of segregation in the U.S. South and South Africa, showed how the framers of apartheid in South Africa looked across the Atlantic and said, brilliant idea, this segregation thing is a good way to protect whites uh, from blacks. And they, they borrowed it from the U.S. and perfected it, tweaked it in some ways. Um, he argued that residential segregation by race was one of the single most successful domestic policies of the 20th century in the U.S. because it's beneath the radar screen but has pervasive adverse effects on outcomes. What's an example of that? Let me tell you of a study done by David Cutler, who is a colleague at Harvard. He was the dean of the social sciences until recently at Harvard, one of the country's leading um, uh, economists. He did a study isolating with fancy econometric models that I cannot even fully describe the effects of segregation on a cohort of a national study of blacks and whites in the US. He estimated that if you could isolate and eliminate the effect of segregation, you would completely erase black-white differences in income, education, and unemployment, and reduce black-white differences in single motherhoods by two-thirds, all of that driven by segregation. Just stop and think about it. We, if we had a magic bullet that overnight could eliminate racial differences in income, education, and unemployment, and this is a profound point, folks, because we like to think of the racial differences in income, education, and unemployment as representing cultural differences, differences in effort, differences in, 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 in training, and, and, and how they were raised. They reflect the successful implementation of social policies. They didn't just happen. They're not acts of God. They reflect the implementation of social policies, and social policies created them, and social policies could be implemented to, to eliminate them. So segregation uh, can, affect, can create pathogenic residential conditions, quality of housing, quality of neighborhood environments. Um, discrimination can also lead to reduced access to desirable goods and services, including medical care. Internalized racism, the extent to which disadvantaged populations believe as true the dominant society ideology of their group. And they believe the, the larger cultural beliefs. That also has negative consequences for health. And there's a body of research looking at that. Racism can also lead to increased exposure to other stressors. And then the, in, the experience of discrimination can be a source of stress. And I, most of my talk will be about the experience of discrimination as a neglected psychosocial stressor. Martin Luther King said that discrimination is a hellhound that gnaws at Negroes in every waking moment of their lives, declaring that the lie of their inferiority is accepted as the truth in the society dominating them. If this is true, then you would expect that discrimination could have adverse impacts on health. There were early studies of discrimination. This is from a review I did in 2003 and one Nancy Krieger did. Um, most studies focused on mental health outcomes. Most used um, self-reported health status indicators. They were almost all cross-sectional studies. Um, most were focused on the US. Um, they were mainly of African Americans and a few studies of Latinos. There were challenges to this early research on perceived discrimination and health. There were some who felt, does it even make sense to talk about racism today in contemporary American society? There were some who were concerned about what they would call the shared, potential shared response bias between measures of discrimination and measures of mental health or self-reported measures of health. And that's a legitimate question to raise. Could it be you're using cross-sectional data and you find an association between discrimination and depression? 
Well, which way is the arrow going? Could it be that there are depressed people who are seeing discrimination that doesn't even exist, reporting it, and their depression is leading to a report of discrimination? Um, and could it be that there is confounding that between personality characteristics, there are some people who are neurotic. And because of their neurotic personality, they perceive discrimination doesn't even exist, uh, and they report it, uh, or it's social desirability. You ask them a question about discrimination, they think you want to hear about discrimination, so they said yes, they report it, but it didn't really happen. They're trying to please the interviewer. So there were all of these concerns raised about the quality of the data. Let me just quickly tell you that Many of those questions have now been put to rest. Uh, this is an early paper I did with Tony Brown and others of us at the University of Michigan. We used the National Study of Black Americans and used measures of health status at wave two to predict reports of discrimination at wave three. If, in fact, reports of discrimination are driven by underlying mental health status, then we would expect that a measure of psychological distress or a measure of clinical depression at wave two would significantly predict who reported discrimination two years later. We found no association between underlying mental health status and discrimination. There are other studies. This is one by Gilbert G. from, from here, UCLA. Um, prospective analyses, I'm just going to run through them. The studies of adolescents, again, prospectively, increases in discrimination are associated with increases in conduct problem over time. Changes over time in chronic discrimination are associated with increases in depressive symptoms. So we now have a number of longitudinal studies, and these are examples of them, that show, no, it isn't underlying uh, mental health problems, um, and we, we find lo in longitudinal relationships. This is a, a study I, I, I did, it is a review paper I did with um, uh, Selena Mohammed, um, looking, uh, published in 2009, we looked at new studies of discrimination just in the PubMed database between 2005 and 2007. Importantly, just within that period of time, we found 150 new studies, reflecting um, the, the dramatic growth of studies in the area. Um, one of the um, issues that have emerged is that there are now studies of all racial ethnic groups in the U.S., studies of Asians and studies of Native Americans and studies of whites. Discrimination also adversely affects the health of whites, although whites experience discrimination at a markedly lower rate than minority groups, but when they experience it, studies find similar associations with health outcomes. We also have the field of discrimination has gone global. They have recently published papers with one of my students from South Korea looking at discrimination in health in South Korea. There are studies from New Zealand, Sweden, South Africa, national studies from virtually every Western European country, from Canada um, and elsewhere, the UK. Importantly, a number of studies have now looked at the association between discrimination and health and statistically included adjustment for the, the psychological factors we're worried about for neuroticism, for social desirability, for hostility, um, for negative affect. And we find discrimination adversely affects health even after statistically taking into account potential psychological confounders. So the association is much more robust. Importantly, in the recent research, we also have ma many more measures of health status that are not linked to self-report, that are, are linked to underlying clinical disease that was assessed in individuals. So some examples, discrimination, predicting uh, hemoglobin A1C, a measure of, of um, um, diabetes risk, is associated with breast cancer incidence, with fibroids, with subclinical carotid artery disease, also associated with not only health, but with the use of health services. So people who experience discrimination are less likely to follow up on the healthcare provider's um, recommendations and, and to lower levels of adherence, lower rates of follow-up. Importantly, a number of studies, uh, in particular, if we look at self-reported physical and mental health, we now have studies from the US, Australia, South Africa, and New Zealand that shows that discrimination makes an incremental contribution over and above income and education in accounting for racial disparities in health. So we now know that empirically, discrimination makes an added contribution to the gaps in health that we see. It's true, th there's this study by Mostila et al. finds that discrimination helps to account 
for racial differences in birth outcomes like low birth weight. When you add discrimination to it, you help to explain uh, racial differences in, in birth outcomes. To give you a concrete sense of measures of discrimination, I'll, I'll focus on the measures that I have developed, but there are multiple measures out there. There are many measures that have been used. This is a measure of discrimination as major life events, as acute stressful experiences that occur, like unfairly fired or, or for unfair reasons not hired for a job or been unfairly stopped, searched, questioned, physically threatened or abused by the police. So in multiple domains of life, we capture uh, the, the impact of, of, of reports of discrimination. If someone reports this, I use a two-stage approach. It's called in the literature. If someone reports it, we then ask them, what do you think was the main reason? And so we can get their attribution. So globally, we ask the question, we can get any report of discrimination, and then we can get the person's attribution as whether it was due to their sexual orientation or race, ethnicity, or gender, or social class, or income level, or religion. So we can capture discrimination based on on multiple domains. However, that type of those kind of major experiences doesn't fully capture the, the tapestry of discrimination. It's also in the day-to-day -day little indignities that some called microaggressions that occur. These are uh, from a campaign. There was one on this campus too, but this is the students at Harvard making the point that they too are Harvard. And it's, 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 it's a website that lists all of the little microaggressions they encounter in their day-to-day -day life. Um, it has led to what some researchers call racial battle <coughs> fatigue, the result of the constantly having to, these threats to your well-being and uh, that, that, that many minority group members face. So I developed a scale also that, that tried to capture that. I call it the everyday discrimination scale. And it asks questions like, in your day-to-day -day life, how often are you treated with less courtesy than others and treated with less respect? And people act like you are not smart and you receive poorer service than others at restaurants or stores. People act as if they're afraid of you. People act as if you are dishonest. And this is now a very widely used scale uh, globally. Uh, we've used it in South Africa, for example, um, and in, 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 in other countries. And just to give you a, a sense of the power of the evidence we have on discrimination and health, I, I'm, I'm showcasing the work of my dear colleague, Dr. Tenny Lewis, um, that each line on this study, I told Tene I have now summarized her whole career on one slide, which is not true. She's published many more papers than this. But, but it is a striking slide that shows you the, the evidence we have of discrimination in health. Each line on this, uh, on this slide represents a different study that she's published. All of the studies are using the same exposure measure, everyday discrimination. So everyday discrimination predicts high levels of coronary artery calcification, a measure of subclinical development of heart disease, predicts higher inflammation measured by C-reactive protein, predicts higher blood pressure levels. Among women who were pregnant report discrimination, lower birth weight infants, a sample of the elderly, more rapid declines in cognitive functioning over time, a community study, poor sleep measured both um, by act actigraphy as well as by self-report, a study of the elderly followed over time, discrimination rarely increases their risk of death, literally killing them. Um, and then a study of African-American and white women, discrimination um, assess the association between everyday discrimination and weight. Discrimination in this study was unrelated to waist circumference, unrelated to waist hip ratio. And then they use imaging data to separate two types of ab abdominal fat. The visceral fat, which is the deep fat in between the, buried between the internal organs, and then the subcutaneous fat, the fat that is closer to the surface. What, why that's important is we know from a point of thinking of cardiovascular risk, the kind of abdominal fat that really matters and predicts your risk is the visceral fat. Discrimination was unrelated to subcutaneous fat, but predicted elevated risk of visceral fat. So exactly the type of fat that predicts elevated risk um, for cardiovascular disease and stroke outcomes and diabetes risk. Discriminate, higher levels of discrimination, this is the actual way the dose-response relationship between tertiles of discrimination and visceral fat. So we now have fairly, I usually present a slide to say this, this slide alone tells the story of the development of the work on discrimination and shows the range of outcomes 
for which discrimination has adverse negative consequences. It's not only the discrimination affects the health of disadvantaged uh, uh, individuals because of actual exposure, but like other measures of stress, uh, Julian Thayer has done a lot of work of the extent to which it's not only the actual stressful experiences you have, but a threat of stress, the possibility that you might encounter stress and therefore the activities that you engage in to protect yourselves from the threat of stress. I wrote about this, this constant psychological vigil and uh, the impact, I call it a state of heightened vigilance um, that it could have. Um, and I was particularly intrigued, developed this notion when I wrote about this in, in 2004, I was particularly thinking about the evidence of nocturnal dipping in blood pressure. So there were a number of studies of ambulatory blood pressure that found uh, among healthy individuals who did not have a blood pressure problem, black and white. And they found something intriguing. During the day, among these young, healthy individuals, there was no racial difference in blood pressure. At night, a racial difference in blood pressure emerged because the blood pressure of whites, the nocturnal decline in blood pressure for whites, was larger than for African Americans. Another way to state that, these studies find in multiple cities in the United States, all found the same thing, black people maintained a higher level of blood pressure even while they were sleeping. It's as if your, envir your environment is so dangerous and so threatening, even when you're asleep, you have to be in vigilance, like you're sleeping with one eye open because of the threat that you face in the environment. We now have three studies that have now documented the non-dipping of blood pressure in African Americans at night is linked to exposure to discrimination during the day. We now have three studies that show that the work of uh, Elizabeth Brondolo and others have, have now documented that. In 2005, in addition to the everyday discrimination scale, I developed a scale based on the qualitative literature that I call the heightened vigilance scale. That asks individuals after I describe the experience of discrimination, thinking about those experiences you just told me about, how often do you think in advance of the kinds of problems you're likely to experience? How often you try to prepare for possible insults before you leave home? Quick example of that, when I lived in New Haven, Connecticut, I remember there was a young uh, uh, African-American male, was a good friend of ours, very successful businessman, but very young. If his wife needed a gallon of milk and he had to run to the supermarket to get a gallon of milk, he would put on a jacket and tie before he went outside. <laughs> He's smart, <laughs> but it was, it was his strategy. But what does that mean if in your entire life you're constantly thinking ahead of what you have to do because your environment is so dangerous and the threat of you being falsely accused and falsely picked up uh, can become a problem. I want to share with you quickly three recent publications that have used the, uh, some version of this heightened vigilance scale, worked by, with Thomas Levist and colleagues. Vigilance predicts elevated risk of depression and contributes to the black-white difference in major depression. A study with Hicken and colleagues, vigilance predicts elevated risk of sleep difficulties among African Americans independent of income and education. In fact, you completely explain the Black-white difference in sleep quality that's been documented in multiple studies when you add vigilance over and above income and education. Um, another study of vigilance and hypertension, um, we found um, as vigilance ex increased, the racial gap in hypertension widened. And vigilance increases the odds of hypertension in African Americans and Latinos um, in the United States. And importantly, we document in this study that vigilance predicts hypertension independent of exposure to discrimination. So vigilance making an independent contribution to blood pressure levels. One of the areas where we need needed research, and I want to show you just some emerging evidence from a couple review papers that shows the strength of the evidence in this paper. It's kind of distressing as, as a father <laughs> of, of how strong the evidence is that the association between discrimination and health starts so early in life. Here is a study of, of, of over 5,000 fifth graders from three cities, a single item measure of um, discrimination. 
This is the level of discrimination reported among fifth graders, 20% of the African American kids, and 15% of the Latinos, 7% of whites are reporting discrimination based on their race or color in fifth grade. And this is the relationship between discrimination and uh, increased odds of mental health problems, 2.9 increased risk of fifth graders being depressed, 1.6% increased risk, um, 1.6, 1.6, um, increased odds, sorry, of um, ADHD, ODD 1.8, conduct disorder 2.1, so huge elevated risk among very young infants. Here is a review paper um, uh, documenting discrimination among children and adolescents uh, globally, um, in increased risk of mental health problems, increased risk of behavioral problems and delinquent behaviors linked to exposure to discrimination, increased risk of poor pregnancy outcomes among women um, in, in multiple studies, increased risk of maternal depression um, in, in multiple studies. In fact, this is a study we did in Detroit uh, where we found that these low-income women, uh, low education, food insecurity, financial stress, poor housing, lack of child care, were all associated with maternal depression. When we added everyday discrimination to the model, none of the other risk factors remained significant. So everyday discrimination trumped the other risk factors predicting um, uh, depression among these um, young low-income mothers in the city of Detroit. Um, multiple studies linking discrimination to adolescent substance abuse, and a number of studies intriguingly documenting that the experiences of discrimination in the parent is affecting, adversely affecting outcomes in the kids. You can measure discrimination in parents and it predicts outcomes in the kids in a number of studies, predicting substance abuse in children, predicting anxiety and depression in children, as well as pre predicting um, uh, poor parenting behaviors. So again, we are documenting that actually what parents experience they bring home and it adversely affects their interaction with their kids and even the health of their kids. So again, the, this evidence is quite strong. A more recent review paper by Naomi Priest, and Naomi Priest is intriguing, uh, Naomi Priest is from New Zealand, not New Zealand, sorry, Australia. And she's been working with Yin parties. They, uh, they have an in, innovative group in Australia doing fascinating work documenting not only the discrimination in health, but doing innovative interventions to address uh, racism as well. Again, uh, the 121 studies they found in this 2014 review just of discrimination in children and adolescents. So again, the, the growth area and telling us the importance of looking at um, uh, discrimination across, uh, across the life course. Um, I need to move along here quickly. So Gil G has written a wonderful paper. If you're interested in taking the life course seriously, this is a wonderful paper in the American Journal of Public Health of thinking about how we take the life course seriously as we think about discrimination. Quickly, let me mention some notable findings. This is what we know for immigrants with increasing length of stay in the United States, their health declines. This is a paper done by uh, Bill Vega and colleagues that document that um, what they call acculturation stressors, including stress about discrimination, legal status, and problems speaking English, is one type of stressful experience that predicts the worsening health, mental health, for Mexican Americans in the United States over time. So again, discrimination actually is contributing to this worsening health. Here is a study by Jean Brody, uh, a southern uh, rural sample, that discrimination predicts increase allostatic load. Allostatic load is a measure of biological functioning across multiple domains. Um, there's enormous interest in the scientific world in telomere length, a measure of aging at a cellular level. And this is a study by David Che documenting discrimination is not only affecting mental health, but literally in conjunction with um, internalized racism is predicting more rapid aging as measured at a level of the cell. Uh, we need to measure discrimination comprehensively. Um, there's work now documenting an association between historical trauma among Native Americans. That's how often they reminisce and ruminate about what has been the genocide against their ancestors predicts poorer physical and mental health for them today. There's a work that 
I, I think we haven't paid enough attention when a hostile racial environment is created, the consequences that has. This is a study of the Duke lacrosse team incident. There were a number of studies where an uh, African-American woman said she had been raped by the Duke lacrosse team and there was just uh, uh, a lot of media frenzy around it. And many African-American students at Duke, especially women, uh, felt very threatened. And there was this study on campus, laboratory-based study, assessing psychophysiological measures of African-Americans before the event and after the event, and saw differences in physiological functioning among African-Americans in the period of time after the event compared to before. So the, the, the hostile environment was actually affecting them physiologically. Here is another example, Arab-American birth outcomes. Um, uh, in the wake of September 11th, there was well-documented increased harassment and discrimination against Arab-Americans in the United States that was most intense for the six months after September 11th. Diane Lauderdale looked at birth outcomes for women in California six months before September 11th compared to six months after. And what she found for Arab American women only in the six months after September 11th corresponding to the six months of increased intense discrimination and harassment, Arab American women give birth to a higher rate of increased low birth weight infants and preterm birth infants. The same was not true for black women, white men, women, American Indian women, um, Pacific Islander women, um, Latino women, Asian women. It was only true for Arab American women. Um, my colleague, Brandisha Tynes, now at USC, um, has been doing work on, on online discrimination. And this is the first published study documented not only a high prevalence of discrimination in online context, but the discrimination in online context was linked to increased risk of depressive and anxiety symptoms independent of a global measure of adolescent stress and experience of discrimination offline. So we're documenting that the online context is making a unique contribution to the mental health of adolescents and we have more work in this area. Discrimination needs to be understood in the fact that minorities experience a broad range of stressors. This is uh, a measure, one study we measured major life events and financial stress and job stress and childhood adversity and work stress and stress in relationships and stress in neighborhoods in multiple domains. And I'm not going to watch, show you all the slides, but it shows a dose response relationship. The more stresses you experience, the worse your health. So discrimination needs to be understood in all of the other factors. I also want to talk briefly about the stigma and HIV disparities model. Um, this was a, a paper published not long ago by myself and colleagues, um, Barry Ernso, uh, Bogart, Jack DeVidio, and myself, as we thought about the HIV disparities in health and thinking about uh, the stigma that, that drives these um, disparities. I don't think this is working as well. Um, but but you, there's societal stigma which leads to discrimination. Um, but importantly, we think it's important to look at intersectional stigma. You, there's stigma based on multiple social bases. There's both structural level as well as individual level manifestations of these stigma. Um, and uh, they all affect HIV risk, incidence, screening, treatment, and survival. Importantly, our paper focused as well on the fact that we need to think of what are the moderators, the resilience and, re and resource factors at the structural level, um, at, at, the, at a structural level and at the individual level that can in fact make a dis difference. So quickly, just some a quick, few quick points from the paper. Societal stigma linked to race ethnicity drives the racial ethnic differences in risk, incidence, screening, treatment, and survival from HIV and AIDS. This occurs at both structural and individual levels. Importantly, we emphasize the interdependence among multiple co-occurring devalued social identities. You can't only focus on race if you're dealing with, with HIV. We must consider how multiple stigmas, stigmas linked to race ethnicity, to HIV itself, to sexual orientation, to transgender identity or expression, to illicit drug use, to sex work, to incarceration, to immigration, all of these are stigmatized social status that oftentimes co-occurs among some people who have HIV and they may interact each other with each other to affect patterns of risk. Implications of this broader model is one, 
that people at risk of, of and living with HIV experience discrimination from multiple facets of their identity beyond race, ethnicity, and we need to think of all of those facets together. Second, different combinations of these stigmatized identities can produce distinctive responses and experiences, so there may not be a uniform pattern for everyone. Um, some identities may be more prototypical, for example, an HIV positive gay white male, that may be what people think of, and may be very different than an HIV positive gay Native American male, for example, which may be a more an invisible category. We also make the point that stigma is dynamic and the basis and nature of stigma can vary for the same person across different contexts. So for example, black men living with HIV who have sex with men may be stigmatized in white communities due to their race. In black communities, um, like for example by faith-based organizations, due to their sexual orientation, and in black and gay communities due to their zero status. So the same individual, depending on which category, in which context, there's a range of risk, and this more dynamic model of thinking of discrimination and stigma um, is where we need to go. There's some initial research suggesting that when we take multiple statuses into account, risk is higher. Uh, there are two recent studies that, sh that show that. Multiple disadvantage status is linked to increased risk. I'm gonna go over them uh, quickly. Let me just end and leave eight minutes for questions uh, by talking about the fact that there is growing research now paying attention to what might be some resources and resilience factors. That social support seems to buffer some of the negative effects of discrimination on health. That religious support seems to buffer the negative effects. That optimism, being more optimistic in, in this study, um, also buffers the negative effects. There's limited evidence that undoing racism on a global scale has positive effects on health. The bad news is these effects appear to be short-lived um, uh, in, in terms of undoing racism at a global scale. There is some evidence, though, that undoing discrimination at the economic level, reductions in black-white gaps in income, for example, leads to improved health. And there's one study of women with HIV that found an intervention that provide a, 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 a business where they could make and sell jewelry led to improved health and re reductions in risk behavior uh, for these women. This is what my colleagues and I call in the paper we published, the Jesse Jackson Effect. We documented that in 1990, 1988, uh, following a cohort of African Americans over a 12 year period, the, the health of Africans were better in 1988 than it was before 1988 and in 1992, the, la the la final time we talked to them. And when we saw this dramatic difference in 88, the only thing we could come to, that was when Jesse Jackson was running for president, um, and that his, his performance in 88 the second time had positive effects. There's also some evidence that of a reduction in the uh, black-white gap in psychological well-being in South Africa when Nelson Mandela was elected president. Um, there's blacks always in prior studies had reported worse well-being. In 1994, when Mandela was elected, the, the black-white gap was eliminated, reflecting dramatic increases in well-being. Unfortunately, it was not evident 18 months later, so it was short-lived. I've also documented with my, one of my former students, Jennifer Mallet, uh, a, a improvement in the health of blacks and Latinos in the state of Ohio linked to President Obama's successful campaign. We documented improvements in self-rated physical health, which was the only good measure we had. It was an unemployment study, not a study designed to do what we try to do, linked link to health. This also not widely recognized, the criminologists at Ohio State showed that President Obama's election led to a 10% drop in the U.S. murder rate um, in this up to in November 2008, and it remained at that level for six months. Um, and they argue um, that it, it's, it's linked to, in other words, this is the reality, the murder rate drop, and they argued that it's linked to his, in fact, election. So bottom line is, the evidence is quite strong that discrimination matters for health. Uh, the evidence is quite strong that racism in its multiple forms matters for health outcomes. And while there's a lot we need to learn about understanding its impact, more urgently, we need to identify the effective ways to mitigate its pathogenic effects and the feasible and optimal strategies to create what I think is the biggest challenge, the political will and support to dismantle societal structures 
that initiate and support racism, ethnocentrism, anti-immigrant sentiments, and broader incivility in our society. All of that is necessary for all of our collective health. Thank you very much. <laughs> Question at the back. I, I certainly haven't seen that directly, but I think given the, some, I showed you a couple recent studies that show that people who report discrimination based on multiple social statuses, their health is worse, so it would be consistent with, with that. I cer certainly think it's something that could and should be tested. Other questions? Yes. Yes. It is much Everything is worse. worse. That's right. Um, have you seen any research done as to whether that's because of a delayed diagnosis due to um, mistrust in the healthcare system or anything like that? No, the, the evidence we have on the lower rates of depression for African Americans, I mean, there, there are some people who wonder if it's a measurement issue. Um, and there, there have been, you know, issues of, of measurement in the past, with, with particularly with schizophrenia, they've been well documented. Uh, there, there's diagnostic bias um, is an issue. The best evidence, though, comes from studies of um, general populations. So you're looking at people in treatment and not in treatment. So these prevalence estimates are not coming from treatment data. It's looking at everyone in treatment and not in treatment. That doesn't mean that there still couldn't be biases in the instrument. I think the, the finding has been replicated multiple times and I personally, my personal view is that there, there may be some measurement issues, but I, I believe that the, the findings are robust. And, and the reason I believe the findings are robust is that they are consistent with the suicide data. For a hundred years, if you look at the 50 leading causes of death, there's one of them for which African Americans have had a markedly lower rate, and that's suicide. The rate of suicide for African Americans has been markedly lower than that of whites for 100 years. The, the gap is narrowing, primarily reflecting increasing rates of suicide among African Americans, and intriguingly in a paper published by Vonnie McCloyd and, and colleagues some years ago, showing that a group of African Americans where you see the largest increases is among middle class young African Americans. So it's not actually even among the most vulnerable groups is where the increases are, 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 are striking. So to me, the suicide data is hard evidence that is quite consistent with the, with the, with the depression data. So I think there may be methodological issues, but I, I, I think the patterns are, are, are real. Yes. Right. I, I, I think you, you have partly answered the question. You've partly said some of the things I would say. No, really. I mean, and, and, and the, the ACA legislation requires much more attention to population health and community benefit. And, and some of the suggestions you make, for those of you who would want to look at one good discussion of it, um, the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation's Commission to Build a Healthy America, its 2013 report uh, entitled A Time to Act, if you Google A Time to Act, RWJ Commission, um, one of our recommendations is for healthcare systems and providers in the United States 
to put more health into healthcare, to, to radically re-emphasize in what we do, um, uh, providing and in promoting better health. I mean, we don't have a healthcare system, we have an illness care system. Um, going to the doctor does not have much to do with health. It has to do a lot to do. It's, our healthcare system functions as a repair shop that takes care of people once they get sick. Um, don't misunderstand me. I think it's vital to have a doctor, <laughs> to go to a doctor, but let me put it this way. CDC estimates that we spend, of the money spent on medical care in the United States, two or three cents of every dollar is spent on prevention. That's what it has been every year in the last 20 years. We've never spent more than three cents out of the dollar on prevention. So we can certainly have a greater emphasis on prevention. I was just on the IOM committee that um, recommended the, the social and behavioral measures for the electronic medical record um, last, late, late last year. And that's another avenue of if we can build into the routine practice of care key social and behavioral factors that are powerful risk factors, and if we can then link our patients to those, the physicians don't have to become social workers, but they need to be able to link others to social workers and, and other resources that address the problems that people face. So that's exactly where we need to go. I think our time is yes, unfortunately, virtually time. up. Um, there were three hands. Um, I, I am happy to stay back and answer your questions for the, the three who would raise their hands. But, but thank you very much for being a great audience. <laughs>